to a new episode of Agile TD Mondays. Today with Alex Schwartz and his talk about the Agile testing principles to help you to make conscious decisions. But first, the good news. The call for paper is open, so put on your thinking hats, sharpen your pencils and submit your paper until the 9th of April. You can find all the information on the Agile Testing Days homepage. And now to Alex. Uh, thanks a lot, Sabine. Thanks for having me and um, a warm welcome to everyone out there who's joining live or for everyone else who's joining the recording. So I'm going to talk about the Agile testing principles. Um, well, I would like to claim that what I'm talking about is quite general. Um, what I'm going to talk about is something that has been proven valuable for me and valuable for the teams I was working with. And I don't know, maybe it's helpful for you guys. You can make up your own mind. Now let's get started. The Agile testing principles, I will not switch to slides. I will do everything here on the whiteboard with some pre-prepared material. So for me, there are four principles which are extremely valuable. The four are the following ones. The first one is early. For every activity, every time we think about quality, we try to address this as early as possible. Principle number two is low, which means with regards to the architecture, we try to test as low as possible. And I know give a brief introduction, we will dive into the details in a few minutes. Principle number three is all of us. Whenever we have the question, who is going to do something? Well, the answer should be, all of us. And principle number four, that is, it's about all the time. When do we care for quality? Well, all the time. It's not like that we could prepare a product and in the end try to test and test and improve it until we have quality. Many industries learned decades ago, it's far more valuable for them to build in quality much, much earlier in the process. Yeah. Now let's take a little bit a deeper look at all those four principles and later we explore a little bit why we find them so valuable in our daily work. Mm -hmm. So for the principle number one, early. This is of course very much in regards of time and it's very, very related to the process that you might have. So usually you would have processes where you where you in the end you have a testing phase and in the testing phase well of course you probably probably identify some bugs and those bugs has to be fixed as well we know all maybe we know quite well what might happen in a situation like this right um here the last phase is very very hard to estimate we could probably understand quite well for a product how long it takes to test it intensively but however, how many bugs are we going to find? Hmm, hard to estimate. Maybe we can use yesterday's weather to give us some guidance. This might mean, oh, we look at how many bugs we had in the past. But other than that, right, this might vary a lot. And how long what might it take to fix a bug? Hmm, even more difficult, right? How should I know how difficult it is, it is to fix a bug? Maybe I know it after I did. So the idea for testing early is we try to have all the conversations about quality as early as possible. When this gets started, well, hopefully this starts the very, very first time we ever talk about an idea about, for instance, a user story. Look, let's look uh, first about a user story. When we talk about a user story, usually it's introduced here in an early stage and then it's discussed with a few people. Then it's developed and usually quite in the end, it's given to some testers and then they should do some manual testing. In contrast to that, we could have a lot of benefit by actually reversing the order. So let's invite everyone from the team here in the first phase, especially the testers, analyze very much in the beginning the acceptance criteria of the story. So when it's really acceptable, which value would we like to achieve for an end consumer? And also how we would test it, how we test it manually and how we test it with test automation. And those discussions can very much happening here quite in the beginning, which means dealing with quality most of this time, for me, the important point of time is as early in the process 
as possible. This takes away a lot of causes for surprises, right? In case we talk in the beginning about scenarios, I probably find out that I have a problem when my external service is down, right? And I don't want to learn this in production. I probably would like to learn this in the very first discussion. And then we already implement a strategy to mitigate this. And then we never have a problem in a production system. So this is all about early. Now let's turn to the principle testing as low as possible. In the HR testing community, quite famous is this pyramid, the test architecture pyramid. This has here in the lower level, as you probably know, the unit tests, here are component tests, and here are system tests. And here, the width. This should give some guidance for the number of tests, the amount of testing that is happening, right? So here, a lot of tests could be happening quite here, very much low level, which just a few ingredients with one class under test, or even better, with just a few methods of this class under test. Then we have component tests taken more into account, or system tests. Especially with system tests, they had been, let's, mm, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago. It was quite common to say, yeah, we put all the ingredients together. Let's say we're working on a web application with a database. So we do all the testing using some Selenium scripts with a full system. But this might involve actually testing a few bits and pieces that, well, could be tested easier, right? For instance, a little bit of the business logic. I don't have to test it in a full with using a full database and a big system, which, for instance, due to the UI, might have some layout. And for me, a very helpful way of thinking about it, we try to look at which every aspect we would like to test. So for instance, for a website, do I have um, in a form the problem of injection, for instance, SQL injection. Well, very good aspect to test. The business logic that every single case is tested, um, and so on and so on. So many different aspects. For all of those aspects, from my opinion, from my opinion, there is not a single place where they should be implemented. For me, it's more like that. We have all those building blocks, and they're falling down. So we test low, right? So they're falling down. We have gravity, and then they they find their own place and they find, for instance, a lot of tests will be end up here, very much low level. Some others are going to be component tests and for sure we will have some system tests. And when we look at this, right, this itself is for the one story, for one aspect, is forming its own little pyramid. That's what I call the Tetris principle. When we look at multi-layer architecture, which my current team is doing quite a lot, right? This also means try to tackle the test automation of one aspect as low in the architecture as possible, right? There is not a need for all the testing to integrate the full huge system, rather than take some bits and pieces, test it as low as possible because every time we test as low as possible, it's much, much easier, and we will have faster feedback. Faster feedback, well, we already saw it. This might be valuable. Furthermore, it's worth to mention that there is now also a strong idea of about the shift left testing, and there will be one of the future sessions which will be fully dedicated to the shift left idea. Let's talk about all of us. In traditional setups, well, who's taking care for the quality? Hmm. It's usually the pure QA manager, right? This guy has been given the responsibility to fix everything that all the other people messed up earlier. Wow, I don't want to have this job. But rather than that, as Lisa explained, right, you could do many things to educate the full team to take over to look at risk quality to take over to look at test automation, those kind of things. Which means one, of the, one part of the mission is step by step, increase the number of people that are dealing with quality, that have skills to deal with quality, for instance, to analyze a certain situation, to come up with good test cases, to do exploratory testing. 
for sure, especially in the context of extreme programming, right? They were teaching, well, as a developer, you take care of all of that. So it's quite natural, which means in the end, we come up with a situation that everyone in the team is going to be responsible for the quality of the product. And now let's turn to all the time. In a traditional setup, usually when we draw the qualities that we have here on this axis, over time, then quite often it's like that. We have the quality at a quite low level, right? And then we try to branch out and then we test it and then we increase it. And eventually we are going to be close to be at a state that we say is releasable or hope is releasable, right? And we usually, I guess many of us experience something like this. I would be actually very, very happy to learn about people which say, I never ever saw something like this. Hopefully there will be a time in near future where this is happening. With this model, we are actually collecting a huge quality depth, right? So everything here in this area is a huge quality depth and it takes a, a very intense amount of work to get to work off this quality. There's another model which could be quite helpful and this is this principle, right? Dealing with the quality all the time. And when we look at the same graph, this would mean we try to be as close as a very good quality level, an achievable quality level as possible. Which means the quality depth that we had, which is in the late testing model, very, very big, is here in this model very, very small. Very small means we mitigate a lot of risk. We mitigate risk, for instance, for the schedule. We mitigate the risk that we have major surprises and we find out that it doesn't work at all. Of course, it's not always po possible to have the perfect quality. Nevertheless, it's a very, very good vision to go for. And there are companies which are as close that they could implement very tiny changes in a very, very short amount of time. And using this approach for all changes, right, they could deliver a huge amount of changes during one day. And I guess in the near future, those are going to be the companies which really have a huge competitive advantage in case they really master this capability. So why do we care about those principles? So for me, behind is, is actually this very famous hockey stick, right? And when we have here the costs for dealing with defects, and here we have time, then we see, ah, it's quite easy and quite cheap to deal with a quality defect in case we catch it early. Fair enough. But the later we catch it, right, the higher the cost. And this is not a linear curve, it's really highly exponential, and actually it's it would have, in real reality, it would have jumps. For instance, when we deploy to production, a bug is far more expensive when it occurs compared to oh, when we just find it in the de early development phase. And using this gives us good reasons to believe in those principles, right? So in case your software system has similar properties as ours, then those principles make sense. Just review them quickly. Testing as early, right? So it means we find the defects early, which means it's much, much cheaper to find them. When I ask a developer, like, uh, what you committed five minutes ago, that's breaking the CI. Oh, then it's saying, ah, that's easy to fix. I know what's going on. In case I'm going to ask him two months after he submitted something, well, then we will have much, much higher costs. Regarding testing as low, right? The testing here very high up would mean we have intensive costs. It is late feedback and quite often it's very expensive as well. You need much, much bigger test systems, which means usually have far higher spending and operations. And actually, worst thing is usually it's more flaky, which means you have to deal with a lot of system properties that make your tests fail, which you don't want to have. Right? So it means it's far more beneficial from a financial perspective regarding good fast feedback to test as early as possible. For all of us, same thing, right? When we find 
uh, flaw, a defect in a story very, very early, then we mitigate a lot of risk. So this might mean that, for instance, we have a discussion about a feature and yeah, we do use some early prototyping, right? So we use some post-its, drawing something on post-its, and then we look at it and say, hmm, do we really need that? No, we don't need it because we can achieve the customer value earlier. Well, this is saving, something like this, this is really saving so much. It might save you multiple months of development work. So all the mechanisms to come up with very, very early feedback are so valuable to implement things much, much faster. Especially, you will be much better with implementing the right things that really make a difference for an end consumer. And for this, right, there is usually in complex systems like in the context, uh, yeah, like the Kinevan framework, where look at this Kalos talks, she can explain in it very, very nicely. The idea is well, there is not a single expert who's able to come up with all those ideas. Actually, it's more saying, this is impossible. There must always be a group of smart people coming together. And only in a group, you have to have the chance of the, to collect this wisdom and to come up quite early with this, eh, this won't work because of that, or eh, we don't need that, or this will be tricky, right? So that means it makes a lot of sense from the financial perspective. And regarding all the time, while, for me, it's so. It, it's such a relief to deal with this low quality debt, right? Because it means, in worst case, yeah, I know this commit, I have to clean it up for 10 minutes. Rather than, oh my God, we created such an amount of technical debt that it now takes several months to repair it. And now we actually have to have a discussion with our manager to ensure that we could work it off. And this is usually a very, very hard and very tricky discussion. And I like pretty much to avoid it. Good. Why we actually invented those principles or started to use them in our daily work uh, with one of my teams uh, was something like 50 months back. We wanted to set up the test strategy again and our complex is quite set up. So we have a multi-layer architecture, multiple operation systems, multiple graphical units which are involved. So it's quite, quite complex. This also means our test harness in, in general is not quite small. We have around about 10 different test suites. You can imagine that's quite difficult to give guidance like where to implement a test. And for this kind of guidance to make the right decisions, those principles had been helpful, at least for a few of our team members, but maybe more and more of our team members. Every single time we decide something, we try to double check, ah, is this following those principles? Is this ensuring early feedback? Are we testing as low as possible? Is it involving all of us? One nice question is, can every one of us see the status? Is everyone receiving the reports? Is everyone aware of it? Who can change it? Who can commit to it? Who feels responsible? And also for the all of all the time, right? We try to ensure that we don't collect too much debt without talking about it beforehand. Yeah, with that, I would like to hand over to Sabine to cover questions in case there are questions right now. Hi, Alex. Um, no, there are no questions. Answer the question I asked myself because why are you using the principles and why you invented them? For those of you who uh, tuned in in the middle of Alex's talk, I want to tell you that the call for paper is open and you can submit uh, your papers uh, from now on. You can find all the information on the Agile Testing Days homepage. Now I want to tell you who's going to be my guest next week. Next week, uh, Loverlin is going to talk about approval tests and he will provide a side-by-side -side comparison of how uh, approval testing is changing unit testing. If this sounds great to you, then tune in and join us next Monday. So thank you, Alex, for your talk. I enjoyed it. it